Podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, today we're going to be covering the latest M&A equity market and industry trends in the healthcare and life sciences consulting space. Uh, my name is Ramon Param. Um, I'm a director in Equitex Global Market Intelligence team based in New York. We're delighted to have unique insights on today's webinar from Liam Logue, um, Global Head of M&A at UDG Healthcare. The webinar will last around 45 minutes, um, followed by some time at the end for Q&A. Um, you can use the question box on the right-hand corner of the panel um, to post questions, which we will look to cover at the end of the session. So kicking off firstly with some introductions, I lead the market research function at Equitec, where I write much of the firm's thought leadership. Um, I previously worked at the Macquarie Group and was also a founding member of PwC's global corporate development team, where I advised the accounting network on targeting new businesses and also on buy side M&A, um, advising on global deals like PwC's acquisition of uh, Booz & Co, now known as Strategy and. At Equitech, in addition to looking after the firm's thought leadership, I also hold relationships with active acquirers of consulting businesses to ensure that they're being uh, appropriately incorporated into our sale processes. One of these um, active buyer relationships that we're delighted to hold is with Liam, um, who I'll hand over to for an introduction. Yes, thank you, Ramon. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Liam Logue, and I am Executive Vice President of Corporate Development at UDG Healthcare. I've been at UDG for quite a long time. This is my uh, 16th year now at uh, UDG, but the, the company I joined way back when uh, was very different to what the company is now. Uh, the business I joined was predominantly an Irish uh, pharmaceutical distribution company with some operations in the UK. And we set about transforming uh, that company uh, to uh, make the company into what it is today as a pharmaceutical services provider. And in that time frame, we've seen our share price increase approximately uh, by a multiple of uh, 10, uh, a tenfold increase. Uh, I think this, that gives me a, a nice segue into describing uh, who UDG are today as opposed to um, who they were in the, in the past. So UDG is uh, headquartered in Ireland. We're a multi-billion market cap company and we're a healthcare services company. So our clients are life science companies primarily, but also med tech companies, uh, hospitals, um, insurance groups, and so on. Uh, we're international, we're in 25 different countries. We employ over 9,000 people. And UDG splits into uh, two different pieces. Uh, the biggest piece is a division called Ashfield. And uh, in Ashfield, uh, we are a marketing services company. We um, help our clients in commercializing their products, um, in communication strategy, and post-promotion support services. Um, that business started out as a tactical marketing execution company. Uh, that means that we were doing stuff on behalf of our clients. But over the last number of years, we've been building um, a consulting and advisory arm within Ashfield, which is becoming very important to us. So uh, here, while we're not in fact executing services for our clients, we're in fact inv advising them in what to do, particularly around marketing and commercialization of products, but not exclusively that. We also provide services to hospitals, insurance companies, and right across the healthcare value chain. Then, just the, our other division does something totally different. Uh, Sharp, in fact, is a packaging business. Uh, we run and operate packaging factories, so pharmaceutical companies can outsource their packaging function uh, to us. 
So that's a quick sum up of uh, who UDG Healthcare are. Great. So kicking off um, just with a run through of our agenda for today, um, we recently published our 2018 Healthcare and Life Sciences Consulting M&A report, which reviewed M&A and equity market trends across the space up to the end of 2017. Um, the webinar will update everyone on these trends through 2018 um, and we'll discuss specifically deal activity through the first half of a year, um, hot segments uh, within healthcare and life sciences consulting, regional trends, major recent deals, um, including a look at UDG's recent M&A activity. Um, and finally, discuss important trends that we're monitoring looking forward over the next 12 months. So kicking off with a look at M&A activity over the first half of 2018, um, we can see from uh, this slide that the number of deals closed in the first half of the year declined as compared with the first half of 2017. Uh, but we did see a rise in median deal sizes and valuation multiples. Uh, the median deal valuation in the first half of 2018 was 1.2 times last financial year revenue and just under 10 times last financial year EBITDA. Uh, both metrics, as we can see, have risen steadily since 2016. Um, they're also now at a premium to what we're seeing across industry verticals in the broader consulting sector. So buyers appear to be focused on a smaller number of larger and higher value transactions. And uh, just uh, giving the UDG perspective as one of the buyers, uh, I would certainly say that this trend is very true and consistent with our experience. Uh, UDG as a company aims to invest approximately $200 million per annum in acquiring new businesses. Um, not every year is even. Uh, last year, we spent about $270 million. But uh, for certain, we are aiming to do a lower volume of deals, but aiming on uh, larger companies as opposed to you know, spreading uh, the, the, the acquisition war chest very thinly for a, a large number of deals. So uh, for certain, our experience is entirely consistent with this in terms of fewer deals, but bigger deals. So um, what are some of the drivers underpinning this strong deal flow, um, and particularly as it relates to larger transactions? Um, so firstly, um, even though um, even though we're seeing signs now that quantitative easing programs are coming to an end um, across the US and most of Europe, um, interest rates still remain low. Um, and that's putting pressure on a lot of buyers to get deals done this year um, before further larger increases in rates occur. We're also seeing an abundance of capital in the market. There continues to be a lot of capital available to do deals um, for both strategic buyers and private equity investors. And low interest rates are putting pressure on these buyers to put capital they have available to work um, with larger transactions. There's also a very strong global economic outlook um, across the US and Europe. Um, the outlook's positive, um, and that's feeding into optimism um, across industry players that are looking for new avenues of growth via acquisition. Now, um, these macro drivers are also being supplemented with strong industry drivers, um, which I'll hand over to um, Liam to discuss. Yeah, so within the healthcare sector, uh, we are seeing for sure that there's increasing demand for healthcare consulting services. And there are a number of drivers very specific to healthcare. I mean, first of all, uh, we are seeing increasing healthcare spending in general. So uh, that is down to scientific advances, uh, new products and new technologies coming to the market on the supply side, but also on the demand side, um, aging populations, uh, rising chronic diseases, 
So in general, you know, we are predicting, let's say in the pharmaceutical sector, that spending will grow at 6% to 7% per annum for the foreseeable future. But beyond overall healthcare spending, for certain there are inefficiencies in the healthcare system. And you know, we would see healthcare as being ripe for productivity improvement and even at times disruption. So as stakeholders look to reduce costs and um, improve healthcare standards, they are turning to consultancies um, who can accelerate that and enhance offerings in doing that. So be that shifts to personalized medicines, um, looking for advanced analytical solutions in uh, an era of big data, uh, looking for smarter reimbursement type solutions. You know, we're seeing a lot of our clients are turning towards consulting companies and that is certainly driving the top line of many of the consulting companies that are out in the market at, at the present time. So uh, underpinned by these strong tailwinds that um, Liam and I have discussed, um, there's particularly strong activity in the following spaces within healthcare consulting. Um, firstly, strategy consulting to life sciences um, or market access consulting is where we're seeing a lot of demand. Um, we're also seeing uh, strong activity in healthcare data analytics, uh, particularly prescriptive analytics, um, process improvement, um, healthcare marketing and communications, particularly digital marketing, um, and healthcare compliance and regulatory consulting is another space with um, a lot of um, by demand. Uh, these five seg segments are where we're observing um, a lot of investor interest from our um, discussions broadly in the market. And from UDG's perspective, uh, we we are inquiring across all of these five verticals within uh, consulting. And just to explain why we're doing this, I mean, first of all, going back to, to the demand side, we're seeing strong demand for consultancies that provide these type of services. So these type of companies are high growth and showing high growing revenues uh, because there's high demand for the services that these consultancies can offer. We also see high margin uh, within these businesses. So you've got strong demand factors on one side, but on the supply side, this is still a fragmented sector. There are many companies uh, providing services um, within each of the verticals. So there is opportunity for consolidation and creating bigger brands uh, within uh, the consulting uh, sector. So as we acquire companies, and I'll talk about some of the companies we've acquired in just a little while, the things that we, we look for are uh, recurring revenues. So sticky customer relationships, very good uh, evidence of repeat buying by customers. So recurring revenue patterns. In general, we're looking for EBITDA margins of 20% or above. And if not that, at least a runway to get to 20% uh, and above EBITDA margins. We're looking with for companies that have uh, client diversity, so they're not overly reliant on uh, one particular customer. Neither would they be reliant on one or two uh, people. You know, you see relationships within the consultancies widely spread across um, a group of people. And we're also looking for businesses that have a well-invested infrastructure. So they've got the, the foundations in place to scale and the foundations in place to pursue strong growth. So that gives maybe some of the reasons why we are investing within this arena and some of the features that we look for in the companies that we acquire. Great stuff, thanks, Lim. So we'll, we'll just flip over now and move on to regional trends. Um, from a, a regional perspective, we can see here that most of the global M&A activity in the space is focused on North America 
uh, and then Europe. Uh, we're also observing larger deals um, and valuation metrics in both of these regions, uh, particularly with respect to um, deals involving more established healthcare consulting businesses that utilize um, some of the latest digital technologies. Um, some of the macro trends in the US which are supporting a rise in uh, deal activity um, includes a generally strong economic outlook in the region. Um, also, the impact of recent tax reforms has um, created more liquidity um, among buyers and um, you know, more capital available to do acquisitions. Um, in Europe, um, even though there's been a lot of political volatility with events like Brexit, um, there still appears to be a very strong positive sentiment across European investors that we're in dialogue with. Um, with respect to cross-border M&A, um, this remains structurally higher in the Asia-Pacific, uh, particularly in Australia and New Zealand. Um, what we're seeing is that globalization, um, the development of more modern healthcare systems in, in the Asia-Pacific region is driving um, you know, international demand for um, consulting companies um, in that part of the world. Um, also, at the same time, looking at activity in the other direction, um, cash-rich buyers from the Asia-Pacific region, notably Japan and India, um, are using M&A as a tool to expand into Europe and the US uh, to reduce their dependencies on local markets. Overall, we typically see um, anywhere between 20 to 30 percent of deals in a given year um, involving international buyers. So that's a pretty, you know, pretty sizable proportion of transactions um, are cross-border in nature, um, and that proportion rises for um, deals above 10 million dollars in size, um, which makes um, international buyers um, even more important to those sale processes. And just to comment on some of these stats, um, I think that these are by and large consistent with our experience. I mean, first of all, UDG is headquartered in Ireland, so all of our transactions are cross-border. Uh, in North America and in the US in particular, we see a higher volume of deal activity. Uh, you know, this is in fact down to the, the scale of the market but also the scalability of businesses that um, operate within the market. So I think that is true that we see bigger deal sizes and more deals in uh, North America, in particular in the United, the United States. Um, in comparison with uh, Europe, you know, our experience is that the difference in valuations are probably not as pronounced as seen here in the um, overall aggregate uh, statistics. But at the same time, it, in our experience, it's true that US businesses are generally higher growth businesses and are often more scalable than European businesses. And when a business has got higher growth potential, uh, that definitely deserves a value premium, which is perhaps reflected in some of the numbers that we see here. Uh, in Asia Pacific, um, where uh, which is our other uh, main geographic region, we operate primarily in uh, Japan, which is the second largest uh, market in the world for specialty medicines. You know, in Asia in general, I would say that the market is less developed uh, for service providers. So over time, we will we we expect to see more transactions in Asia Pacific um, and a catch up towards uh, Europe and North America. Um, but for the moment, our focus is in uh, Japan. We are looking in China, which is obviously a very, very big market. But just given the market is somewhat volatile uh, there, our view is that we'll make only very small bets in the China market. And you know that's a long-term play rather than a short-term play uh, for us. But I'd certainly say that in general, these are stats that are very similar to what we experience. So moving on now to equity market trends, um, 
Equitex developed a, um, a proprietary stock market index called the Equitex Healthcare Consulting Share Price Index, um, which tracks um, the share prices of a variety of listed global healthcare services companies, um, most of which have a significant consulting offering. Um, the index, as we can see here, has rose, arisen considerably over the last 18 months. Um, it, it rose 28% in 2017, uh, a bit more modestly in the first half of 2018, um, but it has um, significantly outperformed um, what has been strong gains from the overall um, market seen in the S&P 500. Um, it's now approaching an all-time high, um, but the performance of constituent players has varied widely. Um, you know, over the last 18 months, we've seen some dips from uh, the likes of Huron Consulting, um, which missed analyst expectations in some um, quarters. Uh, in contrast, players like ICVIR and United Health, um, you know, have been two players that have uh, performed, um, you know, very strongly over the last 18 months um, and, and probably outperformed the broader market. The um, proportion of deals by listed buyers, that's those um, buyers who are quoted on the stock market, um, many of which form part of this um, healthcare index that we, we looked at on the last slide. Um, the proportion of deals by these listed buyers dipped in the first half of the year, um, but their proportion um, of, of activity has remained pretty steady in the range of between 20 to 35% of deals over the last 10 years. Um, so that means over the last 10 years, um, between 20 to 35 percent of transactions have involved a, um, a listed buyer. Um, earnings accretive acquisitions are often a key target for listed businesses. Um, so premium and rising publicly quoted earnings ratios offers listed buyers with a lot of scope to make earnings accretive acquisitions um, at higher prices. Um, with respect to uh, listed businesses like um, UDG, there are um, specific attributes that are important to them um, as a buyer accountable to public company investors, um, which I'll, ha I'll hand over to Liam to discuss. Yes, and we've, we've, we are a public company. We're listed on the London Stock Exchange and we've been a public company for over 30 years uh, now. So as we acquire new businesses, um, in addition to acquiring what, you know, we're always looking for great companies, one of the key things that we look for is some predictability in earnings because investors hate volatility. And uh, you know, as, a, as a result, we're looking for companies that can somehow be, be good at predicting future income streams. So that means being good at budgeting, uh, being good at uh, forecasting, uh, we're looking for companies that invest well in their accounting controls to ensure there are very few surprises in the business. So as best possible, the companies that are most attractive for us are the ones that have done those investments to the extent that they are pre-packed for the listed markets and are uh, public company PLC ready uh, from the get-go. So moving on to private equity trends, um, although the, the proportion of deals by private equities dipped in the first half of the year, um, it's remained pretty steady over the last 10 years at um, over 10% of transactions. Um, so that, that's, um, that participation by private equity um, in the healthcare consulting space is um, higher to what we see in other industry verticals. Um, and the proportion rises above 10% for um, when we just consider larger transaction sizes above $10 million. Um, private equity uh, buyers typically tell us that they're looking um, for um, businesses that are underpinned by strong long-term industry drivers, um, you know, which, um, which is definitely true for the healthcare consulting space, you know, as discussed by um, Liam earlier. Um, and also, you know, private equity like um, the recurring and predictable nature of some of the consulting and managed services work um, to large healthcare organizations, which 
um, you know, overall makes um, this space an attractive one to private equity um, investors. We also ran some analysis uh, recently looking at fundraising for healthcare focused investment firms. Um, this also points to another driver for uh, more recent strong private equity participation in larger transactions. Um, we can see here that fundraising is now firmly at an all time high, um, as is dry powder or capital available for M&A among, um, amongst private equity investors. So, you know, there's strong competition for a limited supply of deals in hot spaces of the market, uh, and this abundance of capital um, amongst financial buyers is all placing um, an upward pressure on pricing um, from this buyer group. Now, looking at some of the major deals announced recently, um, I'm going to discuss um, those that Equitech have advised on. So firstly, our team in London advised um, a business called uh, BQG, the Biotech Quality Group, um, on its sale to um, engineering firm A-System last year. Um, BQG is a business operating at the intersection of performance improvement and compliance consulting, uh, working with life sciences clients. Um, we also worked with a business called ISA, Insight Strategy Advisors, on um, their sale to Precision Health. Um, ISA is a business at the intersection of um, strategy, science, and analytics, and it offers uh, market access consulting services to life sciences businesses. Uh, more recently, we worked with C3 um, on its sale to Encora. Uh, C3 is a process improvement consulting business uh, working with hospital networks across the US. Um, Ancora is a, uh, a consulting firm backed by private equity Madison Dearborn Partners, um, who have recently followed that acquisition up with um, acquiring part of Navigant Consulting um, as Ancora looks to build a significant um, management consulting business globally. So, you know, these are a range of um, recent deals that we've worked on. Um, and they've involved, you know, very different buyers across industries and ownership structures. If I just look at some of the transactions that uh, we have done in the space, you know, if you look over uh, just over the last 12 months, we've had uh, five different transactions. Some of those are very marketing focused. So uh, Cambridge Biomarketing, Micromass and Create NYC are providing services, very much assisting uh, our clients to enhance their, their marketing and sales. But on uh, a company like Smart Analyst, uh, we are providing uh, strategic consulting uh, backed by a strong data analytics capabil capability and in uh, Philadelphia and Boston-based Dynamic, we're a general management consulting covering uh, marketing, process improvement, regulatory services, um, and covering life science companies, hospitals, and insurers. And in terms of the things that we are looking for as we acquire businesses, away from the, the financial features, uh, clearly these businesses are always people businesses. So. Culture is a very, very big, important focus for us. Uh, we're looking for businesses that are great places to work as much as they are great places to, uh, to make money for investors. So we avoid sweatshops. We um, invest in companies that uh, place a strong emphasis on employee well-being. So culture is an essential part of the type of businesses that we bring in to our company. Uh, secondly, we like to see companies that innovate uh, because our belief is that the more innovative a company is, the more barriers to entry it creates and makes it less easy to replicate that business. So in a company like Smart Analyst, the innovation is through a strong analytical capability based in India, which is used to slice and dice data to assist our clients in uh, product prioritization early on in uh, the life cycle of a product, um, in fact, in the clinical trial of a product. 
in Create NYC, we're assisting our clients with advertising and creative communications, but with a, a gig economy, uh, Uber-esque type uh, business model, which uh, offers our clients lower costs, um, offers our clients fixed fees and uh, a faster service. So innovation is a very, very important part of uh, the service that we look for. And then lastly, we're looking for growth. You know, we're a, a growth stock. We present ourselves as being a growth company. So we're looking for businesses that um, are high growth businesses. And an essential part of that is scalability. You know, do these businesses have the processes, uh, the tools, the business model that allows them to scale for the long term and um, be a long term growth story as opposed to a short term growth story? So these are features you would see in every single one of our acquisitions uh, that we've done. And uh, it's a big focus for our uh, future investment uh, activity as well. So uh, looking ahead, um, what are some of the key trends that we're monitoring over the next 12 months? Um, so firstly, we're, we're looking at how the market's going to respond to some of the impacts of uh, gradual interest rate rises and new political reforms in the US and Europe. Um, so we, we discussed that we, we're seeing um, demand to get larger deals done over the next 12 months, um, possibly before steeper rises in interest rates occur. Um, but it's, it's not clear yet um, whether the end of the low interest rate environment um, or some of the upcoming political and economic changes in the US and, U and UK um, are going to impact the current strong M&A market that we've got. We're also closely assessing um, the evolution of new digital technologies, um, particularly in, in areas like uh, robotics, uh, blockchain and uh, smart connected devices. Um, you know, we're now more frequently, um, you know, being told by um, by buyers uh, across industries that, um, you know, digital and the latest digital technologies and consulting around that um, is, uh, you know, an ever more important strategic priority for um, investments. I would uh, just corroborate on the digital side that. Uh, you know, one could argue that uh, the healthcare sector has lagged behind other sectors in terms of uh, digital investment. But right now, you certainly hear um, healthcare companies, and we would hear from our clients, a real drive to uh, move into the, the 21st century and not be a laggard anymore. So we hear uh, trends such as the need for um, Data, uh, advanced data analytics. Uh, we uh, hear the the need for smarter marketing as opposed to one size fits all. So I think that as pharma companies, as hospitals, as med tech companies and insurers, as they embrace uh, digital technologies, there is the need for consultancies that can help them along the journey in um, uh, moving into uh, new technologies. Just one of the other areas where we hear for high demand is the need within our clients for higher productivity and our, the need within our clients to enhance an innovation. So whether that be in the R&D process, bringing more efficiency to the R&D process, be this something around innovation in the delivery of care, be this innovation in terms of better targeted marketing and smarter marketing. We hear our clients all the time asking for more efficiency and more innovation. So I think to the extent that service providers can assist them in that, you know, we'll see, we expect to see higher demand. And just the last point I would comment on as a public company is that to a certain extent, public market investors have fallen out of love with the holding company network model. Um, by what that's what I mean is that the model that 
has been championed, you know, to, to a large extent, perhaps by the advertising groups where you have wide networks of disparate brands and disparate companies that operate quite independently. You know, that's, you know, they've had a good run, but if you look at the stock market valuations for these type companies, public market investors, you know, are looking for something new and something different. So for us in making investments, we're putting a great deal of emphasis in terms of how all the companies that we invest in can complement one another and how we can get synergies between the businesses, not necessarily right away, but over time so that we can really position ourselves as being one company to our clients. So maybe one company with lots of different facets, but uh, not a disparate federation of uh, businesses and brands. So I think that's something you will hear increasingly from public companies uh, as they have to adapt their models. And we're certainly cognizant of that in terms of how we invest and how we develop our business into the future. Excellent. Well, well that, that, that completes the presentation. So um, we're now gonna move on to um, answering um, some of the questions that we've received. Um, so the, f the first question um, aimed really at Liam um, with respect to to UDG is um, a question someone's asked around how a, a buyer like UDG Healthcare uh, would typically structure um, its transactions. Um, so the, the the person here is really asking about, you know, how um, you know how they might consider a, a buyer like yourself structuring a transaction if they were looking to acquire um, a company um, like that themselves in the life sciences consulting space? Sure. So let's yeah. give you an answer on that. First of all, we don't have one size that fits all. You know, we do alter our transaction structure depending on the circumstances. But I, at the same time, I, I'd say there's certain consistent themes for all of our investments. I mean, firstly, we have been primarily structuring our transactions in cash rather than equity. Uh, that's simply because of the uh, low cost of, of borrowing at the present time and low interest rates. Um, as you've alluded to earlier on, uh, Ramon, that may change, but for the present time, cash is, uh, is king in terms of uh, transaction structures. When we are doing our acquisitions, we're acquiring service businesses. So we're acquiring people businesses, they're not product businesses. So most of the time we structure our transactions with one amount paid up front and then a future amount paid in the future uh, based on uh, profitability and profit targets. So those future payments could be over one year to five years. Um, and often as we are acquiring growth companies, this allows vendors to share in the growth of the business while at the same time taking risk off the table, while also it allows us to figure out how to integrate the business rather than having to come up with a plan right away. We can allow a, a level of semi-independence for a period of time and over one year, two years, three years, figure out how to integrate that business better within our company. Great, thanks, Liam. So we've got a, um, another question here um, from a uh, an owner of a strategy consulting firm, um, really asking about how to assess value for their business. Um, uh, the question specifically is, you know, about whether the focus should be on, you know, revenue or EBITDA multiples, um, you know, that are that are reported um, in a lot of our thought leadership. Um, so this is a question I'll, I'll, I'll take, and it's a it's a good question that we get asked um, a lot from um, prospective clients that we're speaking to in the market. Um, so, you know, with respect, firstly, to valuing a, a business, we we typically would look at both revenue and EBITDA multiples from 
um, comparable transactions in the market, um, you know, transactions of businesses that are comparable to the company that we are looking to value, um, and also um, comparable listed metrics. Um, so, you know, comparable listed companies and their quoted metrics on the stock market. Um, we'd also have a look at the output of a discounted cash flow uh, valuation. Um, so all of these different things are all going to be forming part of um, a valuation for a company. Um, you know, with respect to multiples, you know, revenue and EBITDA, you know, we, we probably focus on EBITDA first. You know, the residual EBITDA is what a buyer is going to be purchasing. Um, but we um, we would also triangulate that with the revenue multiple. You know, if the the, the implied valuation based on um, you know, a, a given EBITDA multiple is coming out with a, a revenue metric which is looking very high in, com in, in comparison to, um, you know, market multiples. It may indicate that the margins, um, you know, of the business that we're looking at, you know, aren't sustainable in comparison to other businesses that are in their industry. Um, so, you know, we were looking at elements of both and, um, you know, also it, it's worth noting that when we're valuing a company, there's a lot that we're going to be taking into account, you know, a lot of different financial and operational um, factors um, will be incorporated into assessing what an appropriate value is for a business. Um, and, you know, I would express caution when you're looking at reported metrics in our thought leadership or even elsewhere in the market, you're looking at historic um, financial metrics and, you're also looking at uh, valuation metrics based on unadjusted financials. Um, you know, so all of these are very different to the um, adjusted, you know, last 12 months or one year forward um, multiples that become the focus of um, the valuation exercise when we're looking at a um, um, looking at valuing a company. Um, so, you know. There's a lot of different factors that go into valuing a business, and we we would advise that if you are looking at appropriate valuation range for your company, um, you know, seek professional advice, work with a a professional financial advisor, and um, you know that will help to guide you to uh, an appropriate value. Um, one other question, just m moving on to that. Um, we also received, um, which uh, again, this one's more pointed um, at UDG, um, is with respect to uh, you know business that's being um, sold at the moment, and you know they're they're asking about um, integration and approach to integration. So what happens to my business after a sale is important to me. Um, you know how does UDG approach integrating its acquisitions? Um, so, Liam, I, I don't know if you'd be able to give, you know, a, a little bit of insight in terms of how, you know, UDG might typically look at the integration process. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I would characterize our approach to integrating as light touch, uh, but light touch uh, doesn't mean no touch. So there are changes that uh, happen, but we try and make it as, as painless as possible. Uh, what we do change is the back office. So we do go in quite heavy in terms of uh, integrating to put in place common accounting systems, um, integrating legal processes, uh, integrating compliance processes. So all the things that a large international public company needs to have in place is a big part of our emphasis of how we bring our companies to together. But in the front office and in customer facing activities, we do our very best not to uh, interfere uh, nor change things that don't need to be uh, changed. So from a front office perspective and uh, daily business activities, we try our very best to stay out of the way. Um, Cost savings are not a big focus for us as we acquire companies. Uh, rather, we focus on enabling the companies we acquire to grow faster, so providing more infrastructure that allows growth acceleration. So cost savings in themselves are not a big focus for us. Over time, 
we try to build more synergy between uh, different constituent parts of our company. So that is something that is a, a long-term play for, for us. But in the first year or two, that's something we just explore. We don't try and come up with a magic answer right away in relation to that. So light touch, um, we try our very best to keep it as painless as possible, but needless to say, there are some changes that happen once we uh, buy a company and bring it into our group. Excellent, thanks, Liam. So we, we, we've got one final question here. Um, someone's asked about the second half of the year and what the latest signs are for um, for M and A activity and deal flow. Um, so you, you know, in terms of what we're seeing in in our business, um, you know, across our sale processes and, and what we're hearing from the market in terms of our buyer discussions, um, it's all looking very positive for the second half of the year. Um, you know, those drivers that Liam and I discussed on the presentation um, all seem to be pushing, um, you know, a lot of deal flow through for the second half of the year. Um, and I, I recently looked at um, a, um, a, some data points from data room provider Intralinks. Um, they provide qu quite an interesting predictor of um, deal flow based on the number of data rooms that are opened up on their um, on their platform, um, and that being uh, somewhat of a leading indicator for um, you know growth in M and A volumes. Um, th they've seen you know a, a large increase in the second half of the year, uh, or the beginning of the second half of the year, in, in terms of new data rooms that have uh, come on, uh, and that being potentially a uh, an indicator that the second half is going to be very strong and robust. Um, so, so that seems to be a um, that seems to really corroborated with what we are, um, you know, what we're seeing in the market and what we're seeing in our business. Um, you know, it appears that the second half of the year is looking very strong, um, and we're expecting 2018 to have, um, to be a um, uh, you know another strong year for M&A activity. Excellent. So that, that covers off most of the questions that we've received. Um, we also um, we also received some very specific queries that um, we will come back to you with in the coming days. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for listening and um, thank Liam for participating in today's webinar. Um, if you would like further information on future webinars that we're holding and thought pieces from Equitec, please sign up to Equitech Edge. Um, that's our free source of information for consulting owners that are on a sale journey. Um, and with that, I will um, close the webinar and thank you for um, listening.